That was the great Mac Wiseman with eight more miles to Louisville, and he's with us today to talk about a career that's taken him into every phase of the music business. And Mac, welcome to our humble abode. It's beastly good to have you here. <laughs> Thank you, Art. I'm very pleased to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> You've been a songwriter, a producer, a performer, and a rec recording on a record a music executive. All that stuff. How'd you ever get started in the first place? <laughs> it's a mystery to me. I <laughs> was born and raised up uh, in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. You know, everybody did it. I thought you're supposed to, you know. That's right. A lot of guys came from up in that area. Yeah, right at the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And uh, in the evenings, we'd sit around and pick a little, you know. And, and finally, I got to playing for the lawn parties and such as that. Every time they wasn't looking, I'd slip in and pick a little, you know. <laughs> Did you ever have that in the early part of your career when you had uh, got paid for it and you was making a living at it and somebody would walk up and ask you what you did for a living? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And they, all the people in that community wonder why I didn't get a job, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so when are you going to get you a job, boy? <laughs> yeah, that's work. right. Well, they figured everybody worked. I mean, everybody did some kind of labor. That's right. That's why I still have the greatest respect in the world for farmers and people work with their hands. They turn out something. That's Sometimes I feel a little bit uh, guilty. Do you? About, well, <laughs> no, but Not you know, <laughs> those same people, though, they are the ones that want you to do what you're doing. That's right. That's right. Who was your biggest idols in the music business when you were growing up? Well, you know, I, it was, I've been asked that many times. It's hard to, to pinpoint it, but they longer I'm in the business, the more I realize that people like uh, Bradley Kincaid and uh, the Carters had a tremendous influence on me. At the time, so far as picking out an idol or somebody to copy, I, I didn't. Uh, I guess I, like Jimmy Rogers and uh, Vernon Dalhart was a big favorite of mine and uh, Riley Puckett and guys like that. You're mentioning names that go back 50 years yeah. or more. You know, Bradley Kincaid is still living. Yes. And he's up in years, but now... Bill, Bradley Kincaid and his hound dog guitar. That's right. And, and Asher and Little Jimmy and people like that. Yeah. These are just people I thoroughly enjoyed. And, uh, of course, I wouldn't allow myself to dream that I could ever be competitive or even be acquainted with them in, in those days. It was Well, it was too big a dream. I didn't entertain that at all. You, know? you, just, you, you just listened to the music. Yeah. And just enjoyed it. And did their songs, but I still did them my way. I mean... Uh, I wasn't hard-nosed about it, but it just felt comfortable to do the way I felt them, you see. Now, you were one of the few people in this business who had a formal musical training. Did you attend a, a conservatory, or what did you do? I attended the uh, Shenandoah Conservatory of Music in uh, Dayton, Virginia, but uh, I've got to be uh, very honest here. Uh, that That is a, a bit misleading, frankly, because I didn't major that much in voice or uh, music. Actually, um, I enrolled there to take a uh, general course in radio, and uh, you had to take a certain amount of this musical yeah. uh, agenda to uh, qualify. But actually, I, I took uh, commercial courses and majored more in the radio end of it than I did in the music. I, I never had any formal voice training or, per se. Were you talking about radio as a technically? or uh... Yes. Uh, the local radio station was teaching a course there, and... Uh, I wanted, I'd been doing some entertaining and I, I uh, wanted to know what was going on behind the scenes so that uh, I could at least know what those boys are talking about when they're giving me a hard time. So you turn the knobs and so That's forth. right. I, yeah, that I did uh, disc jockey work and uh, did a little bit of everything. Nothing uh, specialized, but did uh, some copywriting and ran the boards and... Uh, you still have to be, you still have to be a... Uh, technician to be a disc jockey too don't you, you got yes to that's right and uh, do a certain amount of things a bit of engineering yeah and uh, never got a ticket i uh, mean so far as uh, an operator's ticket but uh, i have a little basic knowledge of what's going on yeah. inside you did duets with bill monroe too yes a number of years after that uh 1949 to be exact came here and uh, worked about a year with bill on Elmery. Mm -hmm. yeah was he a big influence on your music Yes, he was. I mean, the, the purity of it and the hard driving part that he did, uh, I uh, found myself admiring long before I came here. I was greatly embarrassed when I hired in with him because I knew very few of, 
very few of his songs that I could uh, do, but it didn't take me long to learn them, you know. No. Uh, I'd, I'd done a lot of the solo things he'd done, but the harmony work that he and Lester had done, I knew very few of those songs. When you worked with Bill, did you do the lead or the tenor? I did lead most of the time. Because he gets some way up there, oh, don't he? Oh, he does indeed. <laughs> I sang a little tenor occasionally, a little high baritone. But, uh, <laughs> you got to hold one foot up to sing tenor to Bill. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, Mac, you met Lester Flatt and Earl Scrubs while you were with Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys, right? No, uh, that's kind of in reverse. I was on the Bristol station, oh. uh, WCYB, and uh, when Lester and Earl left Bill, I disbanded and we organized together. I was a charter member of the Foggy Mountain Boys. Did their first recording on Mercury with uh, Lester and Earl. We worked together there about a year, and then I went to WSB in Atlanta, and from there on into the Opry. But uh, they had already had their stint with Bill before I came in. You know, it's bluegrass is bluegrass, but Bill Monroe's style and Lester and Earl, did they differ? Well, not a whole lot, I don't think. Bill's uh, solo stylings and uh, his tenor singing yeah. are all his own, and of course Lester was more of a solo singer, but... Uh, Actually, I think a lot of Bill's real popularity through the uh, mid-40s was from the duet styling that he and uh, Lester did together. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, Earl's banjo was the real sound that uh, gave that hard-driving sound that Bill had been yeah. after all those years, you know. Oh, Earl, really, he created a thing, didn't he? Oh, he sure did. Yeah, he is known. He's the king of the banjo. I mean, he's, right. there's a lot of great ones, though, brother, believe me. Oh. But they what always... Is... They always go back and say Earl Scruggs was their hero. Right. Now, you, in the early 50s, you uh, you went solo, and you had hits one right after another. Well, I had a pretty good uh, string of luck there. Actually, uh, I accumulated these songs and uh, tried them on stations like WSB in Atlanta and the Hayride and such as that, but never could get on record. So really, I, I had the uh, arm full of songs that I knew had been tested in these markets. Yeah. So uh, it was kind of a foolproof game as long as my songs lasted, you know. What was your first big hit? The very first record we recorded was about the first little independent label, Dot Records, To Sweet To Be Remembered. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that was a great yeah, I used it for a theme song for many years. and uh, Tis sweet to be remembered. Right. I used that for a theme, and that was the first record. Did you write that? No, I have a, an arrangement copyright on it, but I picked this up in uh, Knoxville, oddly enough, when I was working there with Molly O'Day. Dave Durham, remember the fiddle player? Yeah. That, he taught me the melody to the thing. Uh, yeah, that, now, uh, that was in the uh, 50s, but what made bluegrass so popular in the 60s, especially with people who never liked country music before, and all of a sudden the colleges are asking for plain old bluegrass and stuff like that? Of... Uh, I think it was the great movement uh, throughout this country of back to basics and grassroots and, and the college age group who uh, suddenly started doing their own thinking and uh, and didn't care who liked it. Uh, if they liked it, why it didn't make any difference. Before it had been follow the leader right. type thing. But professional people, your uh, doctors and attorneys and uh, a lot of the politicians, uh, we have a lot of friends with the old time music in, in Congress. You think that happened in the 60s? I started uh, start to happen in the late 50s. Uh, and you said when, you said something <clears throat> very interesting a minute ago. You said that people decided to think for themselves and not be influenced by what they're supposed to do. You know? Yeah, yeah. Don't don't. Uh, right. I, I've got to like this kind of music uh, to so I can yeah. elevate my cultural level. That's right. The PDs wouldn't program it because it wasn't the thing you talked about down at the country club. Yeah. I mean, that that was that was the... Uh, it is the thing the now, though. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. You, yes and yes. I think that's great that people will say, I, I won't like this, I don't care. Yeah. I like it, and I don't care who knows it. Yeah. You talk about feeling guilty. I, I really feel guilty because I'm going through the same repertoire for about the third time <laughs> because... Uh, People, the music doesn't change, and people's tastes don't change. I just catch another generation, you see. <laughs> That's right. In the 50s, I had these hits. In the 60s, the, uh, oh, the uh, part of the beat of the folk thing came along, became yeah. folklore, but it was a big deal, you know. I, they picked up on the same 
line of songs and records I did in the 50s. Yeah. And then in the late 60s, the college kids decided to stand up and be counted. And then we went through it again, see. Yeah. And this, this past year, I recorded 40-some uh, sides of it, re-recorded 40-some sides of it that were out of issue. So we're actually on the fourth run. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you get involved in the behind-the-scenes part of the music business? Like it's producing records and so forth. Uh, with working with Randy Wood, who was uh, the owner and the top man at Dot Records at that time, and I was the first artist with him, the first country yeah. artist, and uh, we had a very close working relationship. So when he went to California, he only had a couple of country artists, and he wanted to develop a country department, and uh, he called me up. This was about the time we was really going in that depression. The rock and roll was taking over, yeah. and you couldn't get airplay, and I was looking around wondering. I couldn't join them. And I, uh, there wasn't much way to fight them, so I, I kind of went that route and, and did some production and played uh, shows on the West Coast and around and uh, well, I, dog paddled until it uh, came back in its own again. What uh, What's unique about your style as compared to other artists? Well, the only thing, that, without sounding too egotistical, I think, is the, the naturalness of it. I've done uh, some pop things and even some... Uh, light rock things like Here You Knockin' and uh, One Man Julep was a pretty big record for me. And uh, yet if you take that background and the setting away, it's just me and the guitar any way you want to put it. I, I never go in with a gimmick or a pretense of any, or anything. And uh, the only ace in the hole I've got, which I think applies to a lot of the fellas who've weathered the years, is we were fortunate to be accepted and liked for what we did naturally, so we didn't need a gimmick. You know Ricky Skaggs? Yes, sir. What do you think about him? I, to me, he's a sort of, he's a, a combination of folk and country and got that different little rhythm in his band, though. Yeah. Well, he, he uh, was raised up in eastern Kentucky and was influenced, of course, by the old time music, the mountain music, the Stanleys and Monroe. And uh, I'd like to think maybe heard a few of mine, but uh, I think that's where that influence came from. And, and he, again, is just being himself. And yet he's has been able to develop a wedding of modern country music uh, in with uh, his basic sound. So, uh, Were you the first bluegrass artist invited to the Wembley International Festival? I believe so. Now, if, if I'm wrong, I'm in error. According by, to our information, yeah. and we're pretty good at it, brother. If yes, we know you more about you than you know. Right. You, you were the do. first one. <laughs> I think I was, yes. And I've been there many times and have done the other tour of the Europe tour that uh, he goes on to Switzerland, That's Paris. That's Wembley, England. Right. Now, uh, uh, let's let's talk about this for a minute. Where did the, where did bluegrass music come from? Well, the more I travel over there, the more I'm inclined to think that's where it originated. Well, I think very safely saying that it uh, originated in Ireland and Scotland and uh, those places. When those people migrated here, they came on inland looking for uh, areas that reminded them of their their old homes, like in the southwest part of Virginia and eastern Kentucky, the mountains and uh, and the highlands, so to speak. And uh, a lot of the songs that we do today, uh, the, some of my biggest songs in England and Ireland around are old songs that I know they brought over, like Letter Edged in Black and Barbara Allen. and uh, Letter uh, Edged in Black. Yeah, this is, I can, can't do a concert over there without including It's an amazing that. thing. I will see if you agree with me that all those lonesome songs, like uh, The Letter Edged in Black and uh, I Am a Poor Wayfaring Stranger right. and all those things, they're sad, mm -hmm. but it was an emotional outlet for it people. That, times were rough, brother. That's right. And uh, it's like uh, having a funeral, you know. You get all that out of your system. It's, it's an outlet for them. Well, it's an expression, really, of what you, your inner feelings, really, I think, is what it is. <clears throat> Barbara Allen, see, it's sad. That's right. I, uh, I have, a, for instance, that I think would be of interest to you. Uh, before uh, the Dirt Band did Circle Be Unbroken, I was playing a lot of the college uh, mm -hmm. uh, concerts and a lot of the coffee houses. That's the way we started out, the little places, you know, mm -hmm. where you just sit down with the guitar and they'd sit around the floor. And uh, I would do the Circle Be Unbroken. Like I said, it was before it was a national 
hit with the dirt band and was used kind of like a national anthem as it is today. And I'd have to do it three or four times back to back. And it amazed me why that age group would pick up on such a sad song. My mother's dead and they're going to carry her away. And, and I got to where I'd do a little question and answer session on it. And the best I could get out of it was it wasn't the end thing to say, I love you, Mom, or I'm, I'm sorry for a damn thing. They wouldn't, they wouldn't allow themselves yeah. to say that. But through this song, they could express that. Bluegrass music. Is it different from other traditional country music? No. Uh, I've never have asked Bill how he feels about my uh, explanation of what bluegrass music is. I don't Where did they get the name bluegrass? I always well, took it for granted that that was Bill. It is. Bill Long Bill. in the early 60s when uh, your country music was doing the crossover and, and going the uh -huh. pop route and this thing, the traditionalist uh, and hardcore uh, Old time music people were look, looking for some term that would signify what old time mountain music or hillbilly music was. Mm -hmm. And because uh, of Bill's notoriety at the Opry and the fact his band was the Bluegrass Boys and he's from the Bluegrass State, I think that's how it came about. In other words, had he been known as the Green Mountain Boys, it would have been called Green Mountain Music for the <laughs> same reason. I mean, I really believe that. That's right, exactly. So bluegrass really is terminology. Uh, in essence, to describe old-time music and put a, a tag on it. And now here is Mike Wiseman with a real country classic. <laughs> 